Help! My mother wailed. I can't swim. My spine tingled. I glanced at my father and whispered, It's here. I tightened my grip on the cold metal of my hunting rifle to still my shaking hands. My father tilted his chin back and bellowed, We're coming, Mildred. When the wind finally swallowed the last echoes of his shout, my father turned to me and whispered, Careful now, we're close. Snow crunched beneath our boots. We had spent the better part of three hours out in the ice, but the hunt was nearly over. Don't believe one word. My father whispered for the hundredth time, The Kushtaka will deceive you. It will lie. It will say anything it has to especially when it sees our guns. Remember the smiths. My skin crawled beneath my caribou parka. Angel and Dusk Smith, brother and sister, had been officially listed as missing by the Anchorage Police Department two weeks ago. Unofficially, but as the Alaskans of the old families knew, Angel and Dusk Smith were the last victims of the copy demon, the Kushtaka. For better or for worse, the grieving Smith parents, petroleum engineers from Dallas, believed the old legend. Immediately after the funeral for their children, the pair journeyed from the anchorage to my village, Betiana, to fork over a healthy pile of cash. Six figures, my father had grunted when I pressed him for the number. My father, the only man who ever faced down the Kushtaka and lived, except their offer. A thin shriek filled the crisp air. Henry! Shannon! Hurry, I'm drowning! My heart leapt in my chest. Every warning from my father evaporated. Forgetting everything else, I shouted, Mom! I got three hurried steps across the ice before a hand snatched the hood of my coat and yanked me back. My father spun me roughly to face him and inspected me with one good eye. If I wasn't here, you'd be dead as doornails. He whispered. I shook my head clearer, my cheeks burning despite the cold. He was right. I'm sorry, sir. It'll say anything, he repeated. You have to keep your guard up. Stay behind me. If it calls again, focus on my voice. It'll help you keep your head straight. Yes, sir. Is that you, Shannon? Water splashed in rhythmic flurries against the ice, treading water. Oh, thank the Lord. Help me, Shannon. Help me, Henry. I'm drowning. I shivered. Even now, with my father breathing in my face, that I must not listen, must not believe, I wanted to. I wanted to believe what my ears and brain told me. I wanted to run ahead to where the water lapped at the sky to save my mother. Help. Dad. And now the voice amidst the frantic splashing belonged to my sister, Rachel. Only it wasn't really Rachel in the water, just as much as it wasn't really my mom. They were at home. I'd bid the two of them goodbye not an hour ago. If the Kushtaka knew that, it didn't care. I'm alright, Dad, I mumbled. A lie, to be sure, but my dad often said a good helping of fear kept a man sharp. If he spoke the truth, I was a razor's edge. I glanced over my shoulder. Anchorage had shrunk alarmingly fast. We're far out now, Dad. Keep your focus forward, he said. You wouldn't look away if we was on the trail of a polar bear, and the Kushtak is a lot meaner than any mama bear. It'll eat you up twice as quick. Be careful. Be ready. How much farther? Not far, he said. It's close. It always sounds close. It sounded close since we got on the ice. Hush. Trust me. It's not throwing its voice anymore. Get ready. The ice beneath my boots crunched and cracked. Shannon, my mother shouted. Dad? Rachel echoed. Water splashed in pandemonium from beyond a shelf of ice twenty yards away. There, my father whispered, raising a gloved hand to point out the spot. 
He raised his rifle and then glanced over his shoulder to make sure I followed suit. My barrel shook more than his, but I aimed it in roughly the same place. He whispered something so low this time I couldn't make out a single word. The message sounded brief. Could not have contained more than a handful of words, but they were captured by the wind and carried to the creature hidden beneath the ice. Henry, it's really me. The thing which was not my mother called. It is. We came out of the ice after you to help you, but we slipped and fell into the ocean. Hurry. We slipped, Rachel agreed, spitting the words through a mouthful of salt water. No, not Rachel. Rachel was at home. Rachel is at home. Mom is at home. Rachel is at home. And Mom's at home. I focused on my father. I centered on the sound of his breathing, on the way he moved across the slick ice without letting his rifle stray so much as an inch. By keeping my father in my thoughts, I was better able to remember him standing with me at the front door, with my mother and sister waving us goodbye and good luck. Mom, with reluctant tears, and Rachel, not knowing this was no ordinary hunt, because our parents had decided it was better that she didn't. He did not yell out my mother or sister's names. I think if he did, I might have got to him in time. But as was his way in all things, my father held his tongue. He could not speak his heart, even as it betrayed him. The sound which brought me to reality was the clatter of his hunting rifle when he tossed it into the ocean. His only means of defending himself slid across the white sheet over a lip where thick ice gave way to dark and violent waves and dripped into the water. In the blink of an eye, it vanished. Perhaps the Kushtaka put the idea into my father's head that he could pull my mother and Rachel from the freezing water if he gave them each one of his arms. He had been so worried about me, the Kushtaka was able to sneak past his mental barricade. Dad! He didn't hear me. Or if he did, he gave no sign of it. I gave chase, and knowing I would never catch him before he reached the water, that was when I got my first look at the beast which had taken the smiths. The Kushtaka's black eyes came into view first. Thick, wet cloths of brown fur surrounded a leather-skinned face. It made me think of the proto-humans from old movies, a creature stuck in time between a caveman and the modern man, but with the snout and sharp and needle teeth of an otter. I raised my quivering rifle. The Kushtaka's eyes flickered to me, deemed me no threat, and returned to my father. It opened its pink mouth to reveal rows of teeth that went all the way to the back of its throat. And when the Kushtaka spoke next, it sounded like my mother. Shannon! The Kushtaka tread water just above the surface, holding the edge of the ice floe from beneath to hold it in place in such a way that I could not see its claws. Hurry! Take my hand! My mother called, and the Kushtaka pulled one dripping claw from the freezing water and offered it to my dad. Dad! Alaska, especially my home village, Betiana, is hunting country. Every last man, woman, and child hunts, fishes, and wears too much camouflage. I learned to skin a goat and start a cooking fire before my seventh birthday and was hunting with a rifle before my tenth. Yet, as I raised my rifle to save my father's life, I had never felt less confident. He can't see it, I realized. My mother is right there, and he only sees mom or Rachel. Maybe both. My teeth chattered. The business end of the rifle jittered in the wind like a frightened mosquito. I swallowed, but the wet stone in my throat would not go down. The Kushtaka smiled, and a long black tongue flickered in the air. Give me your hand, it called in Rachel's voice. The two were less than an inch apart when I squeezed the trigger. I held my breath and managed to steady the barrel over the Kushtaka's lying throat. I hollered and squeezed the trigger, just as the beast's claw pierced through my father's coat. I saw his eyes widen in terror and pain. The rifle clicked and did not fire. The sound of my gun appeared to wake my father from his hypnotism. 
He tugged his hand back in revulsion, crying out. His coat tore beneath yellow claws. Blood sprayed across the ice, but he managed to pull himself free to shuffle away from the demon. The Kushtaka barked, and as my father slipped on the slick ice, the creature pulled itself from the water in one smooth, practiced heave. It got onto all four legs, and I saw that it had a six-fingered human hand at the end of each limb, with a sharp claw in the place of each fingernail. My father scrambled back as fast as he could with one hand, while his other glove worked on unhooking the ice pick from his belt. Henry, run! He shouted. The Kushtaka crossed the distance of my father in a single leap and buried its teeth into his shoulder. Then the creature began to pull my father back towards the water from which it had come. He screamed and swung the ice pick between the Kushtaka's neck and shoulder, and its black blood sprayed across the ice like oil. He pulled the weapon free, wound it back, and drove the blade into the beast twice, three, four more times. Despite the severe damage my father inflicted, the beast showed no signs of stopping or letting him free, even when the pick lodged into the Kushtaka's forehead. My father jerked the axe out of the monster and swung down again, a fresh spray of dark blood and another growl from the Kushtaka, but it managed to pull him all the way to the edge of the lapping black ocean tongues. I sprinted towards them, not sure how or whether I could help him, but I knew I had to try. I wanted to club it with my useless rifle, but the Kushtaka was too quick. The monster threw my father into the Pacific with one flick of its neck. The waves parted him greedily, and as the ocean frosted and roared, the Kushtaka dove in after my father, cutting off his gasps for oxygen. It dragged him beneath the waves. No, Dad. When I arrived at the water's edge, it churned in ever deeper shades of navy where it mixed with the Kushtaka's blood. Dad? He was gone. The Kushtaka was injured though, perhaps lethally. My father had buried the pick into the beast at least five times and was ready for another blow when it drove him underwater. Maybe. Dad? I squinted hard, trying to catch movement beneath the waves. Once or twice I thought I saw a gloved finger reach to the surface, but there was nothing. Soon the rippling water settled back to rhythmic waves. I let go and howled my anguish to the ocean. A tremendous splash in the distance signaled some Alaskan beast breaking to the surface. The creature took an enormous inhale and slapped its bulk against the ocean somewhere I could not see. I ran towards the noise, ready to beat the Kushtaka to death with my rifle or give shooting it another try. But I stopped abruptly when the sounds of human coughing reached my ears. Then a familiar voice. Henry! Impossible. But there was no mistaking it. Somehow. Impossibly. Henry, can you hear me? Are you up there? Dad? Henry! Help me for Christ's sake. The water's freezing. I ran towards him. It was a miracle that he hadn't been taken by apothermia already, but if managing to pull him out now, we might be able to make it back to Anchorage before he froze to death. I had to get him out before the Kushtaka could resurface. He probably hadn't killed it, but I stopped. Oh God. Henry, my father called. He might have heard as the pounding of my boots against the ice ceased. Is everything all right? No, I said, unmoving. Pause while my father, not my father, considered my hesitation. God damn it. He might have coughed. But the wind snatched the words and warped them. That sound could also have been a growling animal. When my father's voice rose above the ice and wind again, I could tell he, or it, was trying hard to keep his voice steady. Go back home, son. Go home to your mother. I'm done for. Serves me right for getting fooled. Go on home. No. I won't leave you out here. I just need to figure out how to... how to be sure. Go home, son. He said. I love you. It's alright. I can't leave you to die here. You have to. 
and splash in the water just beyond sight. It could have been my father reasserting his grip on an ice ledge, or the Kushtaka baiting me forward just as it had baited him forward minutes ago. I could picture the beast there so easily, waiting just out of reach, black eyes shining above its terrible glistening smile. Go home. My father was not quite whispering, but his voice had lost most of its volume and all of its edge. Tell me something only you would know. I called. You know there's nothing I could say. He was right. The Kushtaka could throw its voice to mimic loved ones, and it could know your heart and mind. Anything my father might want to tell me, the Kushtaka could copy. If I knew, then it knew. What then? I shouted. What can I do? You can go home. I took another step closer, my shivering hand becoming quite violent by then. I could feel the ice crystallizing against my skin, sucking my life away. If only Mom were here. I tried. Or Rachel. They would know what to do. If it was the Kushtaka down there, it didn't fall for my trick. Go, Henry, my father said after a time. I'm done for. Can you try to get your hand above the ice? I asked. Anything that will help me. It wouldn't do any good, he said. If I was the Kush Talker, I could make you see that hand even if it was truly a claw. Besides, this hole is quite deep. The tips of my fingers could not reach over the top of the... He screamed, loud and sharp. Frantic splashing, then more shouting. Dad? Silence. Dad. There's something in the water. He answered through a clenched jaw. A fish, I think. I think it took my toes. Most of my foot. More splashing. He screamed louder than ever. Dad. I took another reluctant step forward. It tortured me to hear him like that, but the Kushtaka would know just the right strings to pluck to get me moving. The water churned as if it were boiling. Go home, Henry, he shouted over the din. I stepped closer to the edge. I could see that my father had told the truth in at least one regard. The crater was deep. The ice dropped straight down a few feet ahead, into a hole just deep enough that I could not see if man or beast waited below. If I see the fish, I'll believe you, I said. I'll come close to the edge, close enough to see the water and how deep it is. If I see the fish, I'll know you're telling the truth and I'll save you. We can still make it. I became aware that at some point in the last couple of minutes, I had stopped shivering. Hypothermia lurked in my immediate future. Dad? I'm coming to the lip. No, he croaked, but his denial came too late. I had made up my mind. I took a quick peek over the edge, spotted my father, then retreated. If there was no illusion or hypnosis at play, my father lay dying six feet below. At the bottom of his frozen tunnel, the ice formed a small crescent shelf of ice, which my father had hoisted himself onto. His pale skin nearly camouflaged with the ice, and live or die, he was going to lose what remained of his legs to frostbite. The fish had taken a lot of him, the coarse wave caps were pink with his blood. Dad? Don't look. I already saw. A pause. You know it's me? He asked. For the first time since he had splashed out of the black water, I heard a thin layer of hope in that voice. I spent a long time thinking about how to answer. Certainly too long given the circumstances, but... Eventually, I gave him the truth. I don't know, I said, but I'm going to help you. I think it's you and that's enough. Henry, I'm going to throw a rope down. Do you think you can hook yourself on? Both of our coats had metal links for a situation like this one. If climbing or being pulled were required, 
and my father could manage to clasp his various hooks and clamps onto the rope. I could pull them up to safety, or at least I could try. The feeling had run out of my fingers, and even without the extra weight of the ocean in his clothes, my father was a heavy man, but I was determined. Dad, can you manage? Yes, came the weak reply. I threw one end of my rope over the edge, then listened carefully for jingling metal with one hand tight around the rope, and one hand on my rifle. The Kushtaka could mimic human voices, but none of the old stories suggested the creature could imitate the jingle jangle of cold metal. Dad! I called. Click the clasps together as loud as you can. A pause. They're gone. Coat's gone. My heart dropped. The clitter clatter of ice shards being blown across the ice sounded like the Arctic was applauding the monster's sly trickery. If it was a trick at all, or like laughter at my expense. How can that be? Why didn't you say something before? The Kushtaka must have torn it off, he said. I didn't even realize. Cut me up pretty good. Why didn't you say that before? Where did it cut you? I didn't see any blood. The longest pause yet. Dad? No reply. Dad? A thin splash from the bottom of the pit. I dropped the rope and pulled my rifle tight to my shoulder. My father had always taught me to aim with both eyes open, but I could not shake the habit of closing one as I peered down the sight. I'm going to lose him, I thought. Maybe I already lost him. And when I try to run away, that thing is going to have my guts for dinner. From where I stood on the ice, too far from Anchorage to have a dream that someone would hear me shouting. The day had gone from light gray to approaching black. We had less than an hour until nightfall. I stared down the trembling barrel of my rifle. Dad, if you're there, you better say something right now. My heartbeat crashed in my ears so loud that I was not sure I would hear him when or if he did eventually reply. I began to march one more time towards the edge of the ice. The snow crackled beneath my boots like a firework after the explosion. The snow crackled beneath my boots like a firework about to explode. Dad, don't move. I'm coming. There was no answer. Don't move. I heard myself say. I peered slowly over the edge, sliding my boots carefully over the ice so as not to lose my footing and tumble into the black waves. The wind roared. The tang smell of salt water drifted up from the place my father might eventually close his eyes forever. There were two bleeding bodies on the ice shelf now. Both of them were my father. One of them had its head turned towards me. Its eyes were screwed shut in tremendous pain. Go home, Henry, it croaked. Go home, the other echoed. I'm done for. Save yourself. For a moment, I did not speak. I could only stare at the two of them. One my father, and the other an imposter. But I could not begin to guess who was who. They were closer in appearance than twins, exact replicas of each other, even details I'd never registered. The way his hair parted, the wrinkles of his hands, the way his upper lip curled at his own pain, all of it was a match. Dad. Even the puddles of frozen burgundy collecting beside them were the same size. Both pairs of legs floated along the tumbling surface of the dark water, and both of them had lost their boots to the un to the as yet unseen man-eating fish. Dad, kill it, I said. Kill it quickly. Can't move, one moaned. I'll slide into the water, said the other, in equal pain. If I move, I'm dead. Leave me, quick. My mind raced. My father, my real father, was in no condition to kill the Kushtaka but it appeared that the monster was in no shape to kill my father either. He had succeeded in injuring it during their first battle then, or, I realized, 
Perhaps the demon was only fighting injury until I either came down to rescue one of them, or cried off. Go home, one of my fathers rasped. The sun was halfway behind the horizon now. I was no longer risking mild frostbite, or even a couple of fingers and toes. Fleeing across the black Alaskan night, with my father slung over my shoulder or without him, I wouldn't see the opening in the ice that swallowed me. A sharp sob escaped my throat. I hadn't felt the tears building in the corners of my eyes, but now they flowed unchecked, freezing into tiny flecks of ice on the way from my chin to where they dripped onto the ice. Where's the fish? I asked. No idea, said one father. The Kushtaka pulled it under the waves, said the other. Then it came up here and laid down here to trick you. A harsh cough, and then... I don't look so good, do I? You have to kill me, the first father said. A spray of blood shot from its mouth under the ice. Kill both of us. I'm dead anyway. Put a bullet in both our skulls and take the Kushtaka's head back to the smiths for the reward. Don't shoot, said the other. The Kushtaka heard your gun fail the first time. If you fail again, it'll come right after you. Right now, it thinks you had a bad bullet. Hell, that's what I was thinking too. But don't give it the chance to find out you have a bad gun. I said. Isn't it dying? No. The same body croaked. I didn't hurt it all that bad to begin with. And I sure didn't get any more blows in underwater. Don't shoot. I almost killed you, you son of a bitch. The one that wanted me to shoot snarled. Now my son is going to finish the job. Shoot it, Henry. I'm not sure. I need to think about it. There's no time. Shoot. Don't shoot. Run. I don't know what to do. I howled. Run, said one. The thing's head ain't worth risking your life over. It's beaten me. Don't let it have you two. Kill the fucking thing. The other roared, then broke into a coughing fit. Red blood, not black, sprayed across the ice. The night wind purred, begging me to stay on the ice just a little longer. Just until the sun dipped below the horizon. Then I would be stranded. I realized that I had to squint through the last of the remaining daylight to see them. The time to make a decision had come. I'm going to. I stopped. I'm sorry, Henry, said one of the fathers. I could barely make out which one was speaking to the dark. You shouldn't be in this situation, but you are. And for my part, I'm sorry. The only thing I care about now is your safety. Don't shoot. Run. Kill that goddamn imposter, my other father sputtered. Kill it. You have to, or those Smith kids would have died for nothing. I'll have died for nothing, and the monster will take other victims. This is no task for a father to ask of a son, but put a bullet in both of us. I'm going to shoot, I whispered. Do it. No. Save yourself. The ocean lapped hungrily at their legs. I wondered if my father, the real one, was even aware of the tide creeping up. I'm not going back empty-handed, I said. It's not the safest choice, and it's not the one I would make if my only concern was getting out alive. I shook the tears out of my eyes and continued, ignoring the protest of one father and the sputtering encouragement of the other. I'm going to kill it, Dad. I'm going to kill it. Then I'll cut its head off and take it back to Betiana. I'll take care of the family when you're gone. But your gun? What if it misfires again? One asked. What if it always misfires? It'll come for you. It's trying to save itself, said the other. Shoot it. Don't worry about me. Shoot me first if you must, but kill it. Kill the Kushtaka. I'm going to risk it, I said. Truth is, Dad, I'm a lot more afraid of pulling a bullet in the real you than I am that the gun won't fire. 
I lowered the barrel on one of my father's. The rifle wanted to quiver with my anxiety, but I held tight. One of them looked up at me with vague curiosity. The other had turned away. Might have even fallen asleep. He looked so peaceful, and after finally conceding that I had no idea which was which, I fixed my weapon upon the sleeper first. Get ready, said the awake one. If the weapon misfires, you better run. I took a deep breath and squeezed the trigger. The rifle did not misfire. There was no scream. The muzzle flash lit up the pocket of darkness, like lighting had fallen upon my father instead of a bullet. The rifle kicked back so hard I nearly lost it, but I managed to keep the weapon between my mitts. The sleeping father jumped when the bullet rocked into him. I heard a bone snap one of his vertebrae. The black water churned greedily at the body, shaken loose, slid into the ocean's maw. Then darkness rushed back into the hole. The lights of Anchorage streetlights glowed white and yellow at the water's edge, a constellation tracking a safe haven. But the city did not burn bright enough to reveal the lone figure lurking at the bottom of the pit. Dad? Waves crashed against the ice, my father did not answer, but the Kush talker did not growl or pull me to my death either. I took a step away from the edge. Dad? A faint whisper floated up from the dark. You chose right, Henry. You'll have to be quick about it, though. The body's floating on the surface. Get down here, and I'll take his head. I aimed the rifle into the darkness, weeping quietly. Can you pull it to the edge? I don't know. I'll try, but... His words were cut out of the air by the roar of my rifle. I managed to make it back to Anchorage by pure luck. The next morning, I saw the ice was broken in a thousand places, and I had been spared from slipping into the dark water by nothing short of a miracle. It took an hour, but eventually, I reached the pit where I had killed my father... The pit was empty when I arrived, and I cannot sleep for wondering what that might mean.